Hello, I'm Ray. Welcome to another episode, this time all about crime. Now, I've had a lot of emails uh, with various suggestions. I always make a note of everything. A lot of them I've already done, a lot of the suggestions. I have actually done it. Have a look back at the list. I think some people are, are missing some of the episodes that I've done over the years. There are well over a 100. So look back in the list. If you scroll, it depends where you're looking, of course, but scroll back. Look, look at all the previous episodes and you'll see what I've done. Uh, it is quite a list, as I say, well over a hundred. So this one I haven't done, though. Crime. Back in the 50s and 60s, uh, compared to these modern times, hopefully it'll be quite interesting making the comparison. Before I begin, how are you? Hope you're doing OK under lockdown. Is it coming to an end? I'm not, I've, now I'm so confused. It was uh, July, no, June the 21st. Now it's July the 19th. I, I don't look anymore. I don't bother to look at the news and listen to all these dates. As soon as I get a, a date in my mind, it changes. I hope you're enjoying the warm weather if you're in the UK. I've just come in from the garden. It's really hot out there. Had a look at the pond. We've got Mr Frog sitting there on a rock uh, in the shade. So he's cooling down. The pond water is quite warm. That's probably why he's come out. If you want to email me, it's raiserants at protonmail.com. Raise rants or one word, at protonmail.com. Now, crime. When I was, what, 12, 13, I was walking back home from school with a friend of mine, and we popped into a sweet shop. The lady was serving some people, so we just stood there. Uh, I took what I wanted from the shelf and stood by the counter with my sixpence. I had a sixpenny piece. Do you remember those? And this friend of mine, I was watching him. He was choosing this and that and the other. I thought, he's got a lot. You know, he must have quite a lot of money's worth there. Several uh, different chocolate bars and things. I looked back at the lady as she finished serving these people. Paid for my chocolate bar. Turned round and my friend wasn't there. Where's he gone? So I left the shop, found him walking down the road. I caught up with him and said, what are you doing? Didn't you want those after all? And he was eating a chocolate bar. He said, yeah, I've got what I wanted. He'd stolen them. I have to admit, I, I was shocked. I'd not witnessed anything like that before. I was shocked. Walk into a, a sweet shop, fill your blazer pockets with whatever you want and walk out without paying. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know whether to tell my parents or go back and tell the shopkeeper. I, I, at that age, I just didn't know what to do. Uh, I ended up saying nothing. I just kept quiet. Another time... I bumped into him in town one Saturday. Do you remember Lyons Corner House, where they sold teas and cakes and things? Joe Lyons. Everyone of my age, or even a bit younger, remembers Joe Lyons. We were walking past the corner house, and there was a gate. And the gate was open, like a delivery entrance. And there was this huge metal trolley, about five feet high, full of shelves, metal shelves, full of sausage rolls absolutely jam-packed. It was obviously a, a delivery. He walked in there, this friend of mine, as bold as brass, as they used to say, grabbed a handful of sausage rolls and walked back out to me, joined me back on the pavement and started eating one. I Again, I was stunned. I said, what is he doing? As we walked along, he offered me one. Do you want a sausage roll? I said, no, no thanks. Again, I... I don't know, perhaps I was naive. I, I didn't, uh, I, I wasn't streetwise, obviously. I certainly wasn't streetwise. And I didn't want to be. I remember saying to him, oh, I've got to go. You know, I just went somewhere else. I, I left him to do his own thing. After that, I just kept well away from him. When he walked home, I made sure we, you know, I wasn't with him. I either let him go first or I'd, I'd go off before he came out of school. Just kept away from him. He was... A thief. I remember thinking about it. Every time I saw him at school, I'd think, oh, he's a thief. It was a crime. You know, it was a criminal offence. Shoplifting. So that was my first real taste of, uh, well, not taste, uh, witnessing uh, crime, I suppose. There were about 600 kids at our school, and most of us cycled there. You know, we all had bikes. The bike sheds, you can imagine. Loads of bike sheds. Absolutely jam-packed with bikes. And the thing is... I don't think any ever got stolen. I think probably because most of us had tatty old bikes. They weren't worth stealing. And there were so many, you know, everyone had a bike. So why bother to steal someone else's bike if you didn't have a bike? 
they were cheap enough or you could probably get them for nothing. I remember I got one from a friend of mine for nothing. I wanted to make a track bike. Do you remember those with a fixed wheel? I went round to his garage. He didn't live too far from me. In his garage was this this bike, a bit tatty, a bit rusty. I just said, OK, thanks, wheeled it home. I uh, went over to the bike shop, got a, a fixed wheel sprocket, you know, for the back wheel, and I knocked up a, a, a track bike, which was you know, meant to be just for going through the woods and stuff like that. So I don't think anyone bothered to steal bikes, unlike these days where a bike can be, well, easy, a thousand pounds, can't it? Or a lot more, a couple of thousand pounds. Even cheaper bikes are nice. If I say cheaper, like four or five hundred pounds. People just cut through the, the padlocks, don't they? And the, the various bolts, they have um, locks and things. They just cut through them and take the bike in broad daylight as well. So uh, at least we didn't have to contend with anything like that back in my day. I've seen videos on YouTube of people with uh, angle grinders, you know, an angle grinder, and they're cutting through the, you know, these D bolts or D locks, whatever they're called. It takes them a few seconds just to cut through with an angle grinder, chuck the bike in the back of the van or car, which is normally stolen. Off they go. They've got hundreds of pounds worth of bicycle. I suppose there's not much point in going to the trouble of locking your bicycle up or chaining it to a lamppost or something. You know, they'll just cut through the chain and take it anyway. Wouldn't be surprised if they cut through the lamppost and nick that while they're about it. With this episode in mind, I went out for a walk. I nearly forgot. I uh, made a little audio recording. I was looking for crime, criminal activity on the street, all sorts of things, e-scooters, people going wrong way up one-way streets. I remember a bicycle. <laughs> I was in my car. And this bicycle was coming towards me. It was a one-way street. And I stopped and sort of shook my head at this woman. And she stopped by my open window and said, I said, it's a one-way street. And she shouted at me, that does not apply to bicycles. Oh, OK, actually it does. But there we are. I wasn't going to argue with her. So, yeah, uh, I went out for a little walk to see what uh, was being committed in the way of criminal offences. And uh, rather early in the morning, it was yesterday, uh, actually, and there wasn't much going on. But uh, I'll let you hear what happened anyway. Just off for a walk. Lovely morning. It's about nine o'clock, so all the school runs are over. Just want to see what there is in the way of criminal activity. Just past someone walking a dog. Birds are singing. Ah, oh, there's a bicycle up ahead on the pavement. Coming towards me. Man in his, what, thirties? What's he going to do when he gets to... Oh, he's, hang on. He did give me a wide berth, but that's illegal. Cycling on the pavement like that. The thing is, with cycling on the pavement, if someone comes out of their front gate and they've got, say, hedges either side of the gate, they walk out of their path onto the pavement straight into a bicycle. I'll be editing bits out of the audio because you don't want to hear traffic all the time. And me just plodding along the pavement. So I shall cut a few bits out. There goes a girl on a scooter. You've probably heard her. Beep, beep, beep. She's whizzing along on a scooter. It's not an e-scooter. And it's not illegal. Quite a few people about with dogs. Out for a walk on this summer morning. There are several cars parked on the pavement. Is that illegal these days? I'm not sure, to be honest. I'm just going to cross the road. Nothing coming. Oh, yes, there is. Bicycle. Bicycle's actually on the road. Yeah, there are several cars on the pavement, parked on the pavement, or half on the pavement. Is that illegal? I don't know. I'm just going to stop here and have a look round. I saw a car before I switched the recorder on. It's a 30 mile an hour zone. He must have gone past me at least 40 or more, which is obviously illegal. And of course, at night, the amount of bicycles there are around with no lights. That's totally illegal as well, no lights. Back in my day, you'd have been nicked for that. Apart from having to look out for bicycles, 
some of these uh, electric wheelchair th or buggies or whatever they are, you know, they, they go whizzing along the pavement. And I've often thought if someone steps out of their, their pathway or something, they're going to get flattened. You, know, you get quite a large person in a, a buggy that's bombing along the pavement. It, it could be lethal. Of course, in my day, we didn't have these electric buggies. Well, they had the uh, the little two-stroke. Remember the blue, uh, what they called invalid carriage that used to pop potter about? But I don't think they were on the pavement. They were on the road. They were proper licensed vehicles. So a lot of this sort of thing wasn't about something else these days that happens that I wasn't aware of then are uh, the amount of muggings that go on. Someone walking along the, the street on their mobile phone Next thing you know, someone on a bike or an e-scooter or a moped, they drive by and they just grab it, snatch it. Off they go. You've lost your mobile phone. You've got to be very careful if you're in a, a busy town or city. If you are on your phone, keep out of the way. Go in a shop doorway or something. Uh, it's awful, isn't it? That, that, that sort of thing didn't happen in my day. I mean, yes, there was a crime. Of course, there, were, there was the Cray twins. So there were plenty of crime, the great train robberies and all this stuff. So, yes, there was plenty of crime about. In fact, only, what, half a mile from where I lived, our local shops, not even half a mile, 1960, so I was nine years old, there was a branch of a, a, a bank. A couple of lads went in there with a sawn-off shotgun, uh, obviously to rob the bank, and they, they shot, one of them shot the bank manager, shot him dead. I mean, that was, I remember, I was only nine, so I wasn't that up on all the, the news and everything, but I remember hearing people talking about it. I remember overhearing a couple speaking out in the street, and they were saying he's been murdered. And you know, I was just, well, I was shocked. This was our local shops, you know, where I used to go over and get sweets. Oh, buy sweets, I hasten to add, not nick them. Of course, back in those days, people didn't have mobile phones. All they had on them to steal or you know, to be mugged for, I suppose, were cigarettes, lighter and money. They didn't have anything else like a mobile phone. People were mugged, I expect. I, I didn't hear anything about that in my town. I remember hearing that uh, people, if you go to London, beware of pickpockets, that sort of thing. But that was London. That was right in the centre in the city of London. It didn't happen in the smaller towns. Well, not as far as I was aware, anyway. Obviously, Crime has been around for thousands of years. I expect in the Stone Age times, someone went out, killed an animal, dragged it back to their cave, and while they weren't looking, someone else nicked it, <laughs> dragged it off back to their cave. So, you know, it's been around probably millions of years. Well, look at cuckoos. They don't bother to make their own nest, sit on their own eggs. They go to someone else's nest, lay their eggs in it, and let someone else bring up their offspring. So uh, that's, a, that's a criminal offence, surely. Crime these days is different. If you want to rob a bank, you sit at your computer keyboard, hack into the, the bank system somehow and withdraw money. <laughs> you don't have to go in there and threaten people. You just uh, do it online. I remember, what was I? I was, oh, 20s, I suppose, mid-20s. I was in a pub with a couple of friends, in a pub, as you do, you know, up at the bar, having a beer, and this chap came in. He looked really dodgy, you know, he was looking round like a thief in the night, you know. He was looking round, and he came over to us, and he said, do you want to buy a video? And uh, I, I just said, no thanks. <laughs> he said, it's VHS, it's a nice one. Anyway, this chap, a little bit further along the bar, he came over and said, well, what have you got? I'm interested in uh, buying a video. He said, I'll show you, I've got it in the car outside. They both went outside, and about, I don't know, five minutes went by, I suppose. They both came back in. And <laughs> and the chap that, uh, you know, the potential customer, was hanging on to the, the little chap. And he made a phone call. You know, they used to have phones on the bar, pay phone on the bar in some pubs. Next thing we know, a couple of coppers walk in. <laughs> the chap that he tried to sell the video to was a policeman. And that, of course, we were laughing. That was funny. And obviously, whoever's video it was, they... Hopefully would have got that back. But uh, I mean, fancy walking into a pub looking really guilty and dodgy and saying, want to buy a video? <laughs> Dear. A lot of crime was so different in those days. You'd get the, you know, the dodgy geezers come into a pub trying to flog whatever it was they'd stolen. 
uh, quite a bit of that went on. Of course, house robberies, I think there were more house robberies then because there was no double glazing. I mean, these days people have got double glazing. They've got burglar alarms, haven't they? They've got security lights. We didn't have any of that. You, know, you could, you could <laughs> open the windows. Remember the old crittle? They were called crittle windows. Do you remember those? Very popular on a lot of houses, a lot of bungalows. And you could just slip something in there and pull the catch up. You know, you could open the window from outside. <laughs> or people would just break a window. You know, just break the glass and go in. It's very different these days, of course, with double glazing and triple glazing even. If you try and smash that, you're going to make a hell of a noise. I don't know how old I was, probably 11 or 12, and I was out in the front garden. My dad was talking to one of the neighbours on, on the driveway. They were just having a chat. And my dad suddenly shouted out across the street. He said, Oi, you! And I looked over. I thought, what's going on? And there was this chap. He had a bicycle parked outside this, this place. He was looking through the lounge window, the crack in the curtains, you know. Anyway, this chap turned round, saw my dad and, and the neighbour and me, rushed out to his bike, hopped on his bike and cycled off like a maniac down the road. And I was thinking, what's all that about? I asked you know, what, what he was. Was he a burglar or what? He was a peeping Tom. That's the first time I'd heard that expression. A peeping Tom. Apparently what peeping toms do, do you have those? Now, I don't think we've got those these days. What they do is they'd cycle around or walk around, look for a, a crack in someone's curtains, and they'd sneak into the garden and have a look. They spied on people. I don't think that goes on these days. I think most people, they don't have a crack in the curtains anymore. We don't even draw our curtains when we're in the lounge. We keep them open. So all you've got to do is stand outside on the pavement and have a look. And you can see us both sitting there watching telly. Hardly exciting. <laughs> I remember people saying, oh, you know, in the old days, when I was a boy, you could leave your door open, leave your front door, your back door, leave it open. No one would come in and steal anything. I'm not sure that was strictly true, to be honest. I know a lot of people did leave their doors open and neighbours would wander in and out. But when you went out, you locked up. Well, we always did. I remember my... My parents, if we went out anywhere, they locked up. But of course, anyone could get in. As I said, glass, you just got to break a pane of glass and uh, reach in and open the door or the window and you're in. Cars were very easy to steal because there was no central locking, uh, no car alarms, uh, no disabling devices, none of that. So you know, a professional thief, it was so easy to pinch a car. Mind you, they say it is these days. What is it they do? They get a, they get some electronic equipment and they can open the car as you would with a, a key fob thing, you know, where you press the button on your key and your car unlocks. Or apparently they can make some electronic device that does that. So you can go up to a, a car, a nice Mercedes or a decent car, activate your electronic device and you're in. And a lot of cars don't need an ignition key anymore as such, do they? You can start it somehow and they do that and drive the car off. But that, of course, that, that's professional car thieves, isn't it? In the old days, if you wanted a knicker car, uh, there were various ways. Do you remember the, the door, um, the lock, there was a little, little button sticking up. You just poke something in the window, hook it round that and pull the button up and you're in. And then you could hotwire the engine to get the ignition going and start the car. How, how do you know all this, you're saying? How do you know all this? Are you a car thief? No, I'm not. <laughs> no, I just remember hearing about that sort of thing. I did have a car stolen once, a clapped out old Ford Cortina, many, many years ago. I'd left, I'd gone downtown, left it in a car park. When I came back, it had gone. And of course, my initial thought, I'm looking around, did I leave it here? I'm sure I left it here. I looked around, this is the right car park, because I walked around all the other cars. I definitely left it there. Anyway, it had been stolen. And the funny thing was, about a week later, I was just coming out of some shops and I looked across the road to, I don't know why there was a car park. I just happened to glance over there and I saw my car. I thought, I know that car, that's mine. I went over to it. It was, it was my car. I still had the ignition key with me because it was on my uh, key ring with the house keys. And it was all in one piece. Uh, I got in it, it started. So I drove it home. I don't know what it was doing there. I did call the cops and they came and did fingerprints and uh, 
The chap said, oh, no chance. We'll never find out who it was. So, uh, yeah, that was that. I've actually had a car stolen. How about that? <laughs> Just changing the subject for a minute. Do you remember I said earlier about a frog we got in the pond, uh, Mr. Frog? Uh, last night, I was just having a look at him, and he was on a rock, dried out. All his you know, skin was dry, and I thought, that's a bit odd. I waved my hand in front of him, and he didn't move. So my wife poured some water on him, because he looked a bit dry. He didn't move at all. And we thought, oh dear, that's it. That's the end of Mr. Frog. He's a, a, a goner. He's deceased. So uh, we thought, well, that's sad. What we do is leave it to the morning, and then we'll go and bury him somewhere. Went out there this morning, he's gone. So my initial thought was something's eaten him. Something thought, oh, hello, look, that's dinner. But then we noticed between the rocks, there was a frog. And do you know, I think it's the same one? Because I've just been out again and he's sitting on the rock where he was yesterday, where I thought he was gone, a goner, doomed, deceased. So that's all rather odd. I don't know whether he was in some sort of coma or something. But how strange, unless it's another frog, Perhaps the first one was eaten by something, and this is another one. But it looks, well, I say it looks the same. How can you tell? <laughs> How can you tell? I suppose you can't really tell. They all look the same, don't they? But it's the same size, sitting in the same place, and we've only ever seen this one. So there we are. How amazing. When I was about 11 or 12 years old, I was walking along the street with my grandfather, and I noticed something on the grass verge, uh, glistening in the sun, and it was a watch. I picked it up, a lovely watch with a, a leather strap, and it was working, it was telling the right time, and I showed my grandfather, I said, look at this, look what I found. I was quite excited, it was obviously a really nice watch. And he looked at it, and uh, he said, oh dear, someone's dropped that, it must have come off their wrists, and they didn't realise. He said, it's a really nice one as well. And he said, okay, follow me, he put it in his pocket. And I thought, uh, that's my on, that's my watch. <laughs> anyway, we went along, and we ended up at the local police station, because in those days there were police stations everywhere, unlike these days you have a job to find one. Anyway, we went in there, and he said, right, tell the, the sergeant what uh, what's happened, and he got the watch out. I said, oh, I found this watch on the grass verge. And anyway, he took a load of details. My grandfather gave a load of details and filled out a bit of paper. And the, the sergeant said to me, uh, come back in three months' time. If no one's claimed it, it's yours. And I thought, wow, you know, oh, no, that's right, it, legally yours, yeah, legally yours. So I thought, wow, that's that's amazing. It's a really nice watch. So three months passed like an age, like three years, almost every day. I was thinking, has anyone claimed the watch? Has anyone claimed the watch? Anyway, we eventually went back. And uh, on the way, my grandfather was saying, honesty pays, honesty pays. Remember that all your life. And I have done, I have remembered that all my life. Anyway, we went into the police station and the chap on the desk, he, he looked up and uh, my grandfather said, bought a watch in three months ago. Right, oh, he said, I'll go and check, see whether it's still here or whether it's been claimed. And he came out with this watch and he said, there we are, it's yours. So uh, my grandfather said, no, it's this chap's here. And the copper gave it to me. He said, there you are, that's your watch. I was, I was delighted. And as my grandfather said, I could have kept it anyway, but that would have been stealing by finding. That's an odd one, isn't it? Stealing by finding. If you find something in the street and you keep it, that is actually stealing. Quite interesting, that. I mean, yeah, I'll be honest. I have found money in the street. You see a fiver or ten pound note flapping around on the pavement. Oh, thank you. I'll have that. I'm not going to take that to the police station and hand it in. You know what I mean? Something, OK, I suppose, technically, that is stealing by finding. But uh, anyway, there we are. So I had a lovely watch, which I wore for, oh, I don't know, many years. Of course, there are no real comparisons, because, as I said, these days there are mobile phones to steal, uh, computers, laptops, iPads, tablets, all this stuff, whereas back then there wasn't all that sort of thing. And, of course, also, these days there are more people more cars, more houses, uh, populations increased dramatically. So there's more crime. You know, the crime numbers will go up with the more people, I suppose. So it's not really a fair comparison. It just seems, though, that back then, um, I'm going to bang on about it again. I've said this in several episodes. I used to love seeing the policeman ride by on his bicycle. 
Uh, even when I was sort of early teens, he'd say, hello there, all right. And you'd look up, you'd wave, yeah, hello. You know, you knew the local copper, uh, even us kids. And if there was a problem and, uh, you know, you get a cuff round the head, poof, don't do it again. Oops. <laughs> I remember I was over a building site with a couple of neighbours, uh, friends of mine. We were, what, 12, 13, mucking around on the building site one evening. It was summer evening. And uh, this copper, we heard this, Oi, you lot. We looked over, there's this copper on his bicycle in the road. And he said, come here, come here, you lot. What are you doing over there? You know, it was great. He said, you should be on there. Get out of that building site. And he did say, he said, you'll hurt yourselves. Uh, so his concern was not that we were damaging anything or vandalising stuff, but, you know, we could climb scaffolding or a ladder, fall off and end up in hospital. So he was looking out for us um, as much as anything else, which was great. When I was a radio and TV apprentice engineer, I was 16. And I remember in the workshop, a service manager came up to me and he said, we've got the police here. And I thought, oh, blimey, the police. <laughs> he said, uh, they're interviewing everyone because uh, something's gone missing. And he said, uh, they want to talk to you. And he said, it's in one, you know, which office it was. I went in there, a couple of these CID blokes. And they said, uh, so what happened? Did you you were in the stores. I said, yeah, that's right. This was a couple of days previously. I said, yeah, I was in the stores. And they said, you were given a tape recorder. I said, yeah, that's right. I said, there was Colin down there. He gave me a cassette tape recorder. It was a Philips, a Philips cassette tape recorder, new one in a box straight out of the stores. And what it was, Colin had said, hey, Ray, are you going upstairs? I said, yeah, to, to the workshop. I said, yeah. And he said, would you take that with you, save my legs? I said, yeah, of course. So I took the tape recorder upstairs and he'd said to give it to uh, this chap, Fred. So I said, Fred, oh, that's from Colin downstairs. Oh, OK, thanks. Put it on his bench. And I went back to my bench and that was the end of it, as far as I knew. Anyway, the CID bloke, he said, uh, OK. He said, that fits in with everyone else's account of what happened. So he said, that's fine. Off you go. No problem. Uh, and anyway, what had happened, someone had nicked it. <laughs> Someone had nicked it from uh, from the bench that I put it on up in the workshop, you know, Fred's bench. Someone had taken it. Uh, I don't know whether they ever found out who it was. That was a, another uh, episode of, of crime that uh, I wasn't involved in, but I, I kind of was, well, not part of even. No, it was quite worrying because after that, I used to look round the lads in the workshop and think, well, you know, one of you stole that. Who is it? You know, there's a thief among us. Who is it? And you know, a couple of other lads in the workshop, yeah, we talked about it. Well, someone nicked it. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I don't know what happened there. There were some other incidents as well where a load of stuff went missing from the stores. The police were back again. And they found, apparently around a chap's house, they found a load of stuff, a load of uh, appliances, televisions, uh, fridges, freezers. I, how he'd done it, I don't know. But he'd nicked all this stuff from the stores. And it was all in his uh, in his house. So uh, I don't know what happened to him. He probably got banged up. As I said, it's probably not a fair sort of comparison, really, going back to the 50s and this day and age. It was so very, very different. The way people, most of us, were brought up then, I think, was different. I'm not saying that you know people bring their kids up these days to be thieves, but I think there were more, uh, dare I say, more values. I don't know. I'm going to get into trouble, aren't I? Get emails moaning at me. Uh, I don't know, there just seemed to be more honesty around. I might be completely wrong. Perhaps I'm completely wrong. Perhaps there was just as much, if not more, crime going on then than there is today. I don't know. It just, because you've got to be a bit careful looking back, uh, especially to childhood and early teens, because you're looking through, what is it, rose-tinted glasses, and your memories are only of the good times and stuff, like the summers were always hot. The winters were always snow. Actually, that's true. I don't care what people say. The summers were better and the winters were colder with more snow. Looking back like that, though, uh, to those times, the cr I suppose the amount of crime also we hear on the TV these days, perhaps there was as much, but it wasn't report. No, no, that's not right. Because back then, if someone was murdered in a city, it was big news, wasn't it? You know, those... Uh, that can remember back to those days, you'd watch the news. There were no 24-hour news channels. The news would come on at a certain time, like the 10 o'clock news, the 6 o'clock news. 
if someone had been murdered in London or wherever, it was on the news. It was really big news. Whereas now it gets a mention of three people died in London last night. They were murdered. And it's just, it's almost a, just a brief mention of it. So, so no, I'm not looking back through these tinted glasses. No, it is the case. It, there wasn't as much crime back in those days. But, of course, there weren't as many people. So <laughs> it's a, a bit silly trying to compare it all, really. Now, for those of you who are wondering, did I ever nick anything? No, I didn't. I don't think I've ever stolen anything. Uh, certainly not from shops. I mean, you know, when we worked in the radio and TV workshop, if I was building something, I'd build uh, some electronic part. I'd take some components from the workshop. Uh, no, actually, thinking back, I remember a chap, Tony, his name, he said, get a receipt. That's right. He said, get a receipt. He said, you don't have to give the proper amount. Like if you've got, say, two shillings worth of components that uh, you've got to take home for your own project, he said, go to the shop, get a receipt for one and sixpence, something like that. Or if you've got five shillings worth, get a receipt for two and six. He said, that way you've got a receipt and you know, you've paid something towards it. I suppose that's a bit uh, risky, isn't it? I mean, that's dodgy, isn't it? That's a criminal offence. <laughs> Not paying the full amount. I don't know. I mean, other people just took what they wanted. I remember I had this wallet jam-packed as the years went by, full of receipts. Uh, no one ever asked about it. No one ever said, you know, did you pay for this or what did you pay for that? Did you get a receipt? Uh, I should have kept them. It would have been fantastic to look through them now, you know, from the 1960s. The chap in the shop, Harry, his name, I liked Harry. He'd just write on the till ticket, components, one and sixpence, or seven and sixpence, or whatever it was, you know. I think, looking back to those days, people felt safer. They felt safer in their houses and safer on the streets. Again, probably because there weren't so many people, not so many cars, I don't know. But people definitely felt safer, especially seeing the local policeman cycle around on his bike. You'd see him almost daily. You know, he would just cycle past. He'd say hello to people. He knew people. And he would warn people of things. He'd say, oh, we've got a, a villain in the area. You know, watch out. Someone's doing this or doing that. They're nicking bicycles from sheds or they're, you know, they're after garden tools from sheds. He would tell people stuff like that. It was very, very much a community type policeman with the little community police station. I mean, the police station, I know of several um, that are now just ordinary houses. They were the police, local police station. There wasn't one police station in a town. There was one in the town, there's one on the outskirts of the town, in the village next door. Every village had a police station. But I, I don't know, times have changed. There's no good moaning about it. We're never going to go back to that, are we? I, I don't know what's going to happen, to be honest. Nothing to do with crime, but I think... I mentioned values earlier. I think people valued their possessions more back then because if you wanted... I don't know, say you wanted in the early 60s a transistor radio... You know, it'd be great, carry it around the house, use it in the garden, and all you have was your old valve, your old mains radio, perhaps in the lounge. Now, transistor radios weren't cheap. If you wanted one, you had to save up for it. You'd have to save up money each week out of your wage packet, and eventually you got enough to buy it. You could buy it on HP, higher purchase, but of course there was interest, and a lot of people didn't like credit back then. I remember the amount of people that would say, no, if I haven't got the cash, I don't want it. If I can't afford to buy it, cash, then I don't want it. I'm not getting myself in debt. Debt wasn't a stigma, but it was something that a lot of people didn't like. You know, if you can't afford to buy it, then don't have it. Whereas these days, with credit cards and all sorts of, oh, I don't know, easy payment plans and buy yourself a three-piece suite, a new sofa and everything, you haven't got to pay for it for three years. What? If by then it's worn out. <laughs> I don't know. It was very different. Do people value their possessions as much these days? You buy a three-piece suite. You don't have to pay for it for three years. Do you value it as much as you would have done if you'd had to save up for it? I mean, even after three years, you then just start paying so much a month. I know a chap that bought some furniture and before he'd actually finished paying for it, it was worn out. He'd, he'd got kids and stuff. It was worn out. And they, they 
took it up the tip, and he was still paying for it. I know several people over the years that have gone on holiday, paid for it on the credit card. The following year's holiday, they're booking out the credit card, and they haven't finished paying for the previous year's holiday. Now, that is ridiculous. I know we all like a holiday, don't we? It's great. But to put it on a credit card and still be paying for it when you're putting next year's holiday on a credit card, it doesn't make sense to me. I suppose because I'm old school, I was brought up totally different. You know, that all this credit card stuff. Yes, I've got a credit card. Of course, we've got credit card. We need it. You, you buy online. You've got to have a credit card. These days, you, you have to have a credit card. But we don't buy stuff with it. We pay whatever we have to online with it. And then we pay that back at the end of the month. Don't let it build up. Because, I mean, you can build it up to thousands, can't you? I've heard of people, thousands and thousands of pounds. They're never going to be able to pay it back. So I, what happens there? I don't know. I don't know what happens there. Uh, do they just sort of get let off in the end? <laughs> I really don't know. I know a youngish couple just moved into a house, just got married, moved into a house. They have furnished it. They had new carpets. They have furnished everything. All new stuff, all new gear. And it's all on credit card. I remember my first house. We didn't have a lounge carpet. It was just the, the tiled floor. My brother, he said, look, I've got an old carpet you can have. It's not brilliant. Uh, anyway, he brought it round. We laid it out. It didn't fit properly. Round the edges, there was a gap. It didn't matter. It was a carpet. The sofa and armchairs we were given. Someone said, right, you know, you can have our old one. We're going to get a new one anyway. We filled the house with secondhand stuff. We didn't go out buying new things on, on credit card, on HP. Good grief. <laughs> It was unheard of. You don't do that. You've got the mortgage to pay. It was all we could do to pay the mortgage. We did have a telephone put in. So we had mortgage, telephone bill, electricity bill, gas, uh, rates. Was it rates back in those days? House insurance. You had to run the car. We had enough to pay out, let alone buying a load of stuff, filling the house with furniture and new carpets, uh, all on credit card. Well, you couldn't do it then. It was HP. And you wouldn't have got HP for that lot. Because if you did want to buy anything on HP, they looked into it properly. They didn't just say, yep, OK, take it away, pay us, you know, 10 bob a week or something. They looked into your, your sort of situation, what you were earning, what your expenses were. You probably heard stories about the old days. You go and see the bank manager, stone the crows. You know, what do you want? Well, I, I want to buy a car. Yeah. How much do you earn? Yeah, let's have a look. Let's see. How much do you put in the bank? Have you got any savings? He took at your account. You can't afford a car, he'd say. Get out of here. <laughs> well, he didn't say get out of here. It's, it's so many words. But um, that was a good thing in many ways because you might walk away thinking, oh, miserable old devil wouldn't give me the money for that car. I really wanted that car. But what he was, he was protecting the bank, the bank's interests, obviously, but also your own interests. You know, he would work it out. You can't afford the repayments. You can't afford the higher purchase payments which I think is fair enough. If they did that these days, houses would be empty. They wouldn't have any furniture in, <laughs> no carpets. No, it wouldn't be that bad, obviously. Of course, back in the 50s, not everyone had a telephone, but those that did, they didn't get nuisance calls. They didn't get people ringing up. You know, do you want to buy this? Do you want to buy that? Give me some money and <laughs> all this, all this going, all these scams going on. And when the phone rang, it was someone that knew your number that wanted to talk to you. It wasn't, uh, mind you, you were in the phone directory, so I suppose people could just look you up. But you know, it was people you knew. It, perhaps it was your bank. Perhaps it was your dentist or something. There's a problem or your doctor or your member of family or a friend. I don't remember anyone getting any of these calls like people do today. I mean, just now, funnily enough, this is what's reminded me of it. Just now, my wife answered the phone. And it's someone saying, hey, you having a nice day? And she said, I was, and put the phone down. <laughs> because the thing is, that was the landline. She was on her mobile to her mother, and they were talking about some problem. And they've got, she's then got some idiot saying, hey, you having a nice day? No, I'm not. Why don't you off? <laughs> so it really is bad. And they do it at meal times, don't they? You know, you settle down in the evening. You've perhaps been at work all day. You settle down to your evening meal. And it's the phone. Oh, hang on, I better see who that is. Could be one of the kids or whatever. And it's some idiot. I think I mentioned it in a previous episode. I answered the phone. 
and it's a computerized voice saying, uh, you owe the Inland Revenue money. Uh, there's a fraud investigation. Press one now. If you don't press one now, you'll be arrested. <laughs> I just hung up. I did. I told you that, didn't I, a couple of weeks ago, I think. I just hung up. Some of them, I play a game with them. They'll say, uh, are you at your computer? Oh, yes, I am. Yes, yes. Oh, could you press so? So they want you to type in a an address, a web address, a URL, and they want to take control of your computer. So what I do is play along with it. And uh, they'll say, have you pressed that? Yeah, hang on a minute. I'm just pressing that now. And I just drag it out. And in the end, they <laughs> they normally hang up. It's not me. They normally hang up because they know I'm uh, I'm messing them around. I was going to say something else then. But uh, if I've got the time, it is quite good fun, actually, just to sit down in the armchair with the phone and say, right, OK, what is it you want? And then just play the game. I love it. And I just had a phone call from a, a nice pub restaurant type place we were going to next week. We booked a table as uh, the restrictions are lifting. And they just uh, phoned us and said, sorry, the place is now closed. Uh, one of our staff has been tested positive for COVID. So that's the end of that. <laughs> oh, dear me, no one's fault, not their fault. Just part of everything that's going on at the moment, I suppose. Uh, so I'll have to find somewhere else. We're just going to have a little family outing because um, my father-in-law's birthday next week, he passed away a couple of years ago. And his birthday is a bit difficult, especially for my mother-in-law. So we're going to take her out to lunch. Now, going back to crime, I knew this girl. Here we go. I <laughs> I knew this girl. I won't call her a bird because I get told off. And she found a handbag. She was just walking on the street and it was in this bus shelter on the seat. And she thought, obviously, someone's got on the bus, left the handbag there. So she opened it, had a look, loads of money in it and an address. There was something with an address on. So honesty pays and all that sort of thing. She took it round to the house that evening. And this lady answered the door and she said uh, said to the lady, look, I found this handbag, it's got your address in it. And this woman, apparently, was really rude. What, you've looked at my handbag, you've opened my handbag, have you taken the money? And this girl that I knew, she was stunned. <laughs> that really was stone, that crows. And she said, no, I found it in the bus shelter, had a look inside, found your address and I brought it back to you. So I was doing you a favour, you know, this woman, I'm going to count the money, I hope you haven't taken any of the money. And she slammed the door shut. I, I, I said to the girl, you should have kept the money and chucked the bag in the bushes. She said, no, what I should have done was take the bag to the police station. She thought she was being helpful by taking it to the... Uh, anyway, there we are. I remember her saying, you know, because I said to her, well, they, they reckon honesty pays. And she said, well, not in this case. It was just awful of that woman to, to react to like that. You know, normally, you'd think she would have said, oh, so grateful, thank you so much. Perhaps even said, look, you know, here's a fiver or something, given her some money as a, as a thank you. I mean, you don't expect money, but I don't know, at least say thank you. Crime is so very different these days. Identity theft. What about that? Identity theft. Someone gets your national insurance number, your NHS health number or whatever they do, and they pretend to be you. And before you know it, you know, they're committing criminal offences in your name and you get the cops around your place and you're arrested. <laughs> you did this and you did that. No, I didn't. I was sitting in the garden having a beer. No, no, no. No, no, it's all your details. Look, you did it. I mean, that must be awful, this identity theft thing, to be blamed for things you haven't done. I was blamed for something I hadn't done at school. One of the kids in the toilet block, he, he smashed the window. And uh, he came out. I went in to have a look. Of course, a teacher came rushing in and I'm the only one in there. So it was my fault. And I got the cane. Oh, brilliant. I explained. I said, look, I just walked in there. I heard the what was going on, heard the smash, walked in there. And uh, anyway, there we are. I got the cane for that. <laughs> I knew the kid that had done it. He really should have gone forward and said, look, it was me, not Ray. But oh, well, not to worry. I'll tell you what I found really upsetting the other day. Well, all crime is upsetting, isn't it? But I read somewhere on, on Twitter, I think it was, there were some photographs of uh, down the seafront somewhere, I forget where it was in the UK, but they'd made some, some people had made some really nice little gardens. There were plants and a, a little statue, that sort of thing. Really nice. And they put several of these along the seafront. I think they were in, uh, you know, like concrete blocks, you know, with full of earth. And they'd gone to a real effort to 
make it look really nice. Little plants and, as I said, ornaments and little statues and things, figures in there, figurines, aren't they? So what happened? One evening, I don't know who it was, a bunch of people, I suspect, went along and trashed the lot, ripped the plants out, smashed the little figures, just totally wrecked the whole lot. Why? I just don't understand that. I don't understand any crime. Well, some crime, if there's a chap that can't feed his family and he goes out and, you know, nicks some money to buy food, that's obviously a crime. It's illegal. It's a criminal offence. But there's, oh, I was going to say there's an excuse. No, there's not. Was well, it uh, mitigating circumstances, I suppose? But to smash up a display, several displays that people have obviously gone... You know, to great lengths to make look nice and people enjoy them. Why? What is the point of that? I just don't understand that. Vandalism. I suppose vandalism has been around forever, hasn't it? I don't know. I don't know. But it is such a shame, though, that that sort of thing is such a shame. Another crime that's probably always been around, but I think is on the increase, and that's fly tipping. So, you know, you've got a load of rubbish, you chuck it in the back of your car, drive out into the country somewhere, put into a lay-by or into a farm entrance where there's a gate, and just chuck all the rubbish out there and let the farmer deal with it or the, the council or whoever, let them deal with it. I mean, that is dreadful. Mind you, a lot of them are getting caught. I've seen a lot of videos <laughs> online. You see a chap back his van up or someone in their car, they back their car up to a farm gate, empty all the rubbish out onto the ground and uh, drive off because they've got hidden cameras. Uh, a lot of these little cameras these days, you, know, you can hide one in a tree looking at your farm gate, you know, and it's just rec it'll record when there's movement. So a car or van backs in there and it starts recording. And of course, you've got the, the whole thing on, on uh, video. You've got the car, the registration of the car. You, you've got the people, everything. So it really is fantastic. I did see something online the other day. Someone had dumped a load of rubbish. I think it was at a, at a farm gate or somewhere like that in the countryside. And they knew who it was, You know, the, the farmer. He knew who it was. So he loaded all the rubbish up <laughs> into his big truck thing. And he drove round to the address where these people lived. And he tipped the whole lot. He had this big tipper truck. Tipped the whole lot into their front garden. There were massive piles of it, the old mattresses and, well, you name it, loads of stuff, tipped it all in their front garden. Absolutely. Oh, it serves them right. I think that's amazing. But why do people do that? Yeah, we've all got a local tip. I don't know what it's like in other countries. You've probably got a tip or a refuse tip or whatever. Yeah, we have. OK, you, sometimes you've got to queue up. I suppose that's the problem. You have to queue up. You can't dump certain types of rubbish, blah, blah, blah. So I suppose some people say, oh, well, can't be bothered with all that. I'll drive out into the country and dump the whole lot in the bushes. But of course, someone has to clear it up. I've never understood why you, I mean, they wouldn't do that in their own home. Would they? Oh, perhaps they would. Yeah, would they sort of dump stuff in their garden? Probably. But this is our, it's our planet, isn't it? You know, the earth is our planet. We live here and we're going to pass it on to our children. You know, we're only caretakers, aren't we? We're only caretakers. We're not here forever. You know, we're going to move on to a, another afterlife or spiritual plane or whatever it is you think we're going to. And we're going to leave this to our kids. Well, do our kids want to have to find, you know, they go for a walk in the countryside. It's full of rubbish. Oh, look, there's someone's old mattress. There's an old fridge there and a washing machine. I, mean, I just don't know. I don't understand the mentality of that at all. Litter in the streets, that's another thing. People just chuck stuff in. I saw someone the other day driving along, drinking out of a can. Next minute, the can's flying, empty can, flying through the air, landed on the pavement. Unfortunately, I didn't get the registration of the car because there was another one then behind it and I couldn't see. But I thought then, why do that? Why not just leave it in the car when you get home, put it in the bin? Oh, well, there we are. In many ways, it's a very sad world, isn't it? But as I say, we are caretakers and I think we should take care of the planet. You've probably seen pictures of beaches, you know, now that lockdown's beginning to ease, people all flock to the beach or the parks, the countryside, and when they leave in the evening to go home after a day out, photographs of the, oh, the rubbish, cans and rubbish and wrappers and just rubbish all over the place. I'll tell you what I think they should do. If it's a local park and people do that, just leave it. Just leave the rubbish. 
it'll pile up in the end so high that you won't be able to use the park. And OK, it's only a few people, though, isn't it? I suppose why should they spoil it for the rest of us? If you keep clearing it up, though, they'll keep messing it up. I don't know what the answer is. I suppose the answer is massive fines. You know, you chuck a bit of litter somewhere, it's a thousand pound or five thousand pound fine. People are going to think, hang on a minute, just in case someone is looking, just in case I am on video camera somewhere, I think I'll take that home with me <laughs> instead of chuck it over there in the bushes. Of course, victims of crime can be very badly affected. I remember a young couple, I'm going back decades again, they got married. Uh, they bought a, a flat, they moved in and they had their wedding presents, you know, like you do a kettle and a toaster. And they'd been out one evening, they got back and the window was open in the, the back of their flat. And they looked around, the place was a mess. Someone had been in there, they'd been robbed, they'd been burgled. And all right, they lost the toaster, the new kettle, they could be replaced. It wasn't the missing items that was upsetting. As they said to me, it was the the thought that someone's been into their home, their new home. They, they felt violated. You can replace a kettle and a toaster, can't you? That's not here or there. But someone had been in, rummaging through their things. They felt violated. And that, that is the problem, I think, when, you know, your house is robbed. The, you know, knowing that someone's sorted through all your things. I don't know. It's awful. Oh, we're heading up to the hour, I think. Any ideas for next week's uh, podcast? I have one email. Now, where is it? And where's my papers? I've lost it. I can't find um, somewhere here. What was it about? I can't find it. I'll have a look in a minute. Uh, yes, yeah, so email raiserants at protonmail.com. Raiserants, or one word, at protonmail.com. Email me with your ideas. Be great to hear from you. And I do try to answer all emails. Some weeks I get rather a lot. Other weeks I only get a handful. Strange. I suppose people, if it's raining, are sitting doors emailing me. If it's sunshine, either out in the garden. <laughs> oh dear, I don't know. I should be out in the garden, really. It's lovely sunshine at the moment. Oh, um, is it tonight the thunder's coming in? Is it tonight? Where are we? I don't know what day we are. Uh, yeah, I think we've got thunder coming in tonight or tomorrow night. Thunder and lightning. I like a good storm. It's great. So, uh, oh yeah, because I did threaten you, didn't I? I said I'm going to record it, record the thunder and the rain. And uh, you'll have to listen to it. No, I won't do that because you'll switch off. Oh, here's the email. Look, here we are. Right, what's this say? All about, ah, oh, yes, bills. That was it, bills from the old days. Do you remember? Well, you don't. You might not remember. You might be young. Back in the 50s, you had various bills, like rent or mortgage, uh, rates, um, electricity, gas bill. If you had a phone, a phone bill. If you had a car, not everyone had a car. Then you had insurance and tax and petrol and stuff. Look at the bills now. Now, this is the idea for next week's uh, episode. Look at the bills now. You've got mobile phone. You've got uh, TV channels, various things you pay on the, you know, broadband. There's so much more now in the way of bills. In the old days, do you remember the money boxes? They'd have uh, like a long money box and it would say telephone, rent, electricity, gas, you know, and you'd put money in it each, each day or each week or whenever. So uh, when the bills came in, You'd open your box and you'd have at least something towards each one. That's all gone, of course. Uh, I suppose people now just, whether they can afford it or not, just get the credit card out. But there are so many more things to pay for these days. As I say, mobile phone, you've got your contract or whatever on that. A lot of people, they, their car, they're paying like a couple of hundred quid a month for the car. And then they're quite disappointed after a few years to find that when that ends... The car isn't theirs. <laughs> they have to give it back or they can buy it at some price or other. I don't know. Anyway, that's the idea for next week's podcast episode. Unless you've got a better idea. Raise rants at protonmail.com. Come up with a better idea and I'll chuck the one about bills and that out of the window. Not like rubbish. Mustn't do that. OK, I shall end it here. Thank you for listening. It's been... Uh, a pleasure talking to you. I love making these podcasts. It's really great because I can have a good old moan, a good old rant. Take care. Don't get sunburned if you're going out of the sun. Bear in mind it's very, very strong. Oh, they said on the TV news earlier, what was it? A heat wave in London, I think, today, followed by floods. Yeah, followed by Thursday and Friday, floods. 
so I don't know what's going on with the weather. Look after yourselves. Don't get burnt and don't get caught in the floods. See you next time. Bye-bye for now.